Good morning. morning. I said this in the Sunday School Hour, but it really is a privilege and a joy for my wife Kat and I to be here with you this morning uh, to share with you a little bit about what God has been doing in our lives, to share with you a little bit about what God has been doing uh, in the medical and evangelistic ministry in the country of Benin. Um, We want to thank this church because you have been a great blessing to us uh, by through your prayers. Many of you have written to us to encourage us. Many of you have given us your advice. Uh, You have supported us financially and you have really been a blessing to us. And we want you to know that, I'm sure you know this in theory, but it really is true that the ministry that is taking place in Benin is a direct result of what you are doing here. Uh, And for that reason, I'd like to say that everything that God is doing there, he's using you to do. And I hope that as you think about that, that that will be an encouragement to you, that God is using each of you here in the lives of people in other parts of the world as well. Uh, And it is a blessing and a privilege to be part of what God is doing in the world. Uh, This morning, I'm going to be sharing with you something from 1 Peter chapter 4. Um, And before we do too much, I'd like to take a moment to read that. Uh, In 1 Peter chapter 4, I'm going to be looking at verses 8 to 10 this morning. So I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's read verses 8 to 10. And Peter writes here, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received the gift, even so minister this or even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Amen. Before I continue, I'd like to stop and pray for a moment. Our Father, we praise you for the great God that you are. We thank you, Lord, that when we were sinners, Jesus Christ came to earth to die for us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us, that you've given us your word, your blueprint for how we, as your followers, are to live. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us who is here this morning to be able to understand your word, to make application of it to our lives. Lord, I pray also that you would be with me as I share with people here what you have been doing in my life. I pray, Lord, that what I would share would bring all the glory to you. Lord, that everything that takes place in this service would exalt Jesus Christ. And we pray these things for his glory and in his name. Amen. As I was thinking about uh, what to share this morning, I I was thinking about what was taking place, what God had been doing in my own life this past year, uh, and as well as what God has been doing in the country of Benin. And in the past, when we have been asked to speak both here and in other churches, I have focused on something that was more on a passage of scripture that was more talking about evangelism or about ministry to unbelievers. But today I would like to do something different and I'd like to share with you some pa- a passage here that pertains more to ministry among believers. Uh, and part of the reason is because I've been thinking about that in the context of what God is doing in the world and what God is doing in Benin and what we see around us. And it's something that God has convicted me in this area recently. And so I'd like to share some of that with you this morning. As we look at this passage, uh, what we see here is Peter is writing to believers. And we know that because in 1 Peter chapter 1, in the first couple of verses, he says that he is writing to the strangers who are scattered throughout several different cities, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So these are people who are elect who have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we know that he's writing to believers. And he is telling them how to behave among themselves. Uh, But he's actually talking here not just about their relationships in a casual manner, but he's talking about ministry as well. And that's something that I'd like to focus on today. Specifically, as we look at what God's been doing in the world around us and what's been happening, in fact, on the news around us, I think it is easy for us to forget that sometimes, that as believers, as God's people, God expects us to have a certain kind of relationship with other believers. And when he says this, when, he, when Peter writes this, it's interesting that he's not writing to a specific local church. He's not writing just to the church in Ephesus. He's not writing just to the church in Salem, New Hampshire. He's writing 
to strangers, he said, who are scattered about in all these different cities. And so when he's writing, I don't think he's just telling us how we should behave with respect to the Christians who are around us in our daily lives. But I think he's responding to the way that we should, the attitude that we should have toward other believers in the world. And that's part of what was convicting to me here. And I'd like to share with you some more about that today. Specifically, as we think about what's going on in our country right now, it is very easy in the current climate for us as believers to isolate ourselves and to forget what's going on in the rest of the country and what's going on in the rest of the world. In fact, the government is telling us that we should isolate ourselves and not encounter anybody else and not interact with anybody else. And I'm in favor of that in, to a certain extent, but not to the extent of neglecting the principle that Peter is sharing here. And so that's what I'd like to get into this morning. Um, before I say too much more about this, I'd like to say that when we were in the country of Benin, a big part of our ministry, in fact, I would say our primary ministry, although you may not have seen it that way perhaps when we went out, but when we went out, we said, okay, we're going to the country of Benin to help the local believers start a medical and evangelistic ministry. That is true. And so we were there providing medical care. And yes, medical care was part of our ministry. And then we were there sharing the gospel with patients. That was a big part of our ministry. And we were going to patient homes and sharing our testimonies in their homes and sharing, we were sharing the gospel with them in the clinic. And so evangelism was part of our ministry. But when we, we went there, if someone were to ask me, what is your primary ministry? I would have said, my primary ministry is teaching local believers here in Boifo. Not here in Salem, but in Boifo. And I would have said, this is the real reason I'm here is to work with these local Christians to train them and to help them to be able to continue this ministry in the future. And I think that as believers, we need to always remember that God has called us, yes, to share the gospel, that's very important, but God has also called us to minister to other believers. And those are both important parts of what God has called us to do. And so that's what I'd like us to look at this morning as we think about what Peter has written here to these believers who were scattered abroad in many different cities and think about what he said to them. And so let's look first in verse 8. Peter writes, Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. When I look at this first verse, the first thing that stands out to me in verse 8, in 1 Peter chapter 4 in verse 8, is the importance here that Peter places on this first point. He says, above all things. So when we are thinking about what Peter tells us about how to interact with other believers, this is not just a footnote made on the side. Peter said this is very important. Above all things, you should do this. This is more important, he's saying, than the other things that we just said. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. And that word, as you probably know this already, that word that's translated charity here could be translated as love, but it's a specific type of love. In fact, it's the Greek word agape. And it's not just the word for love that is an attraction to someone else, but it's the word love that means the willingness to sacrifice yourself for the good of somebody else. So this type of love is not just that, oh, I, I have warm feelings toward this person. It's that I am willing to do what is best for that person, even if it's not best for me. And Peter is writing to the believers, scattered in all these different villages, or in all these different cities, rather, to tell them that you are to have love among yourselves, among the other believers. You are to look at other believers and do what's best for them, and not what's best for you. And this word in verse 8 that's translated in our Bibles, Fervent. It says, have fervent charity. The Greek word ectonies means stretched out, and it could have three different senses. I think there are three different ways we could think about it. So when we think about this word fervent, it says to have our, our love should be fervent. So the word means stretched out. Think of like an elastic band that you pull out and it's under tension. And so one possible meaning of that, and it is translated this way here, is fervent, meaning Intense. You take this thing, you stretch it out, it's tight, it's intense. If you try to push on it, it doesn't move easily, it's not floppy. It's an intense love. It's under tension, it's stretched out. And that's the way that it was translated here. And there's one other place in our Bibles that this Greek word is translated this way. In Luke chapter 22, in verse 44, it's translated more earnestly. So that is one possible translation. You could say that this word 
for our love means that our love is to be intense, it's to be fervent, it's to be under tension. So it's not something that's just a floppy love that kind of moves around depending on what's happening, but it's to be tight, it doesn't move, it's an intense love. But there are other possible meanings as well. When you think of something that's stretched out, it means that it's long in duration. And in fact, other than the King James Version, most of the other translations have translated it this way, is that it says that your love should be long-lasting or constant or enduring. It's translated, the same word is translated in our King James Bible in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, without ceasing. So when it says that our love is to be fervent, it could mean that our love is to be intense, it's to be fervent, but it could also mean that our love is not to end. It's not to be a kind of fickle love that comes and goes. It's to be a love that's always there. And then a third sense, which I'm not so much getting from the Greek, I'm just going to give you this as a thought. In modern English, you might say that you could extend your hand to someone else in love. You could say that you could extend love to somebody else. And the idea of stretching out is also that, okay, I'm going to stretch out to you to show love. And I do think that that's part of the sense of this here. Peter is telling these Christians who are in multiple different cities scattered out that the most important thing you can have as Christians among yourselves, you're to have love. You're to be doing what is in the best interest of other believers. And this is a love that is to be intense. It's a love that's to be long in duration, that's to be continue without ceasing, as it's translated elsewhere. You are to be extending yourselves out to others. And when we continue reading in verse 8, he says, Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. He says that our love can cover the multitude of sins. And when I think about this, what I, I picture that what, he's, what, what Peter may have been imagining here is that if you have another brother in Christ or another sister in Christ who has fallen into sin, you don't stop loving them. You don't say, I only love the Christians who are walking with the Lord. That's not the idea that Peter has here. He says that our love will cover the multitude of sins. So we look back, we look out at other believers and we want to do what is in their best interest in an intense way, in a way that is without ceasing, even when they've wronged us, even when they've done what's wrong, even if that person offended me, even if that person hurt me, we are still to have that kind of love for them. That is what Peter is saying first in verse 8. And when I thought about this, this is quite convicting to me. Because it's very easy for us to have love for our friends, the ones who have not sinned against us, the ones who have not wronged us. It's perhaps somewhat easy to have a floppy kind of love that's not, not well love that's under tension, that's intense, but just kind of a, you know, I like you a little bit. But the kind of love that Peter describes here is a love that is intense, that is present despite the sins of others, that is never ending. And he's talking to a group of people scattered everywhere, a group of believers, not just one little congregation of Christians. So as we think about what Peter is saying about how we should act, interact with other believers, the first thing we see here is love in verse 8. And now I'd like to move on to verse 9. Peter continues writing here in 1 Peter chapter 4 in verse 9. And he says to these Christians, use hospitality one to another without grudging. Now, some of you may know that this Greek word for hospitality here is philozenos, and it comes from two words that we may know. You may know the word. You may be able to guess the philo part of the word means it's a kind of love. It's a kind of brotherly love. And then xenos is the same word that we get xenophobia from. It's the idea of strangers. And so when it says here, Use hospitality one to another. The root of this word, hospitality, means lover, uh, being a lover of strangers. And so when Peter tells these believers to show hospitality one to another, he's not just saying to be hospitable to your friends. He's not just saying to invite your friends. He's saying that we are to have this love to everybody, even strangers. And when we think about I'd like to t take a moment to think about what were the consequences of what, what this might have meant to an early believer in the early church. 
If you think about the early church when Peter wrote this, there was a time of intense persecution. And so many Christians were forced to leave their homes, were forced to leave their cities because of the persecution. And when persecution would arrive, they would travel and they would go to another place where they would be safe for a period of time. And you can imagine, you can, in fact, you can think about people like the Apostle Paul, who went and preached the gospel in a city, and then they tried to kill him, went to another city, and they tried to kill him or they threw him out. And so he was constantly traveling. And along the way, there were certain Christians who would lodge him in their homes. And that had consequences for those Christians. And we may not think of that easily, but if you could imagine the Apostle Paul traveling, it might be easy to say, oh, I'd love it if the Apostle Paul came to my house. But I'd like to think about what might happen if the Apostle Paul came to your house. Let's look in Acts chapter 17 at somebody who did this. In Acts chapter 17, I'd like to read the account of what happened to Jason in Acts chapter 17, verses 5 to 9. And as we do this, just think about Jason. This is just a man in the city of Thessalonica who invited the Apostle Paul into his home. And in verse 5, for Acts chapter 17, verse 5, But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These men that have turned the world upside down have come here also, who Jason has received. These all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. So imagine yourself in the early church. Maybe you could picture yourself in Jason's shoes here. And here comes another Christian who's now come into the city of Thessalonica where you live, and you invite him into your home. And what's the result? A mob comes and attacks your house and drags you out and takes you to court and accuses you of doing contrary to the decrees of Caesar, accuses you of treason, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. This was the consequence for Jason. And I, I am sure that this kind of thing, although it's not recorded very often in our Bibles, I am sure that this kind of thing happened on multiple occasions, where believers who were hospitable and invited strangers, other Christians who were passing through, who invited them into their homes, there were sometimes consequences to be had because of the persecution. And so when Peter tells these Christians, who he calls strangers scattered about in all these different cities, he tells them, have fervent... I'm sorry, when he tells them to show hospitality one to another, he's not just telling them to invite their friends over for dinner. He's telling them to do something that involves some personal risk to themselves. He's telling them to do something that could at times be hard. So let's turn back to 1 Peter chapter 4. As we look here in 1 Peter chapter 4, we saw that, first of all, Peter told these Christians that the most important thing was that they should have a fervent, a never-ending love among themselves that covers a multitude of sins. And then we saw in verse 9 that Peter told these Christians that they were to be hospitable one to another without grudging. It wasn't just that you invite this person into your home, oh, well, I, I guess if I can't find any other solution, you can come to my house. But we were to be doing, they were to be doing it with a right heart attitude. And this attitude, by serving these other people, as Jesus told his disciples, when you're doing something for the least of these, my brethren, you're doing it for me. And so our attitude as Christians, the attitude of hospitality, of extending ourselves to help others, who might be in need and inviting them to us. That idea is one that involves service to the Lord. It is possible to serve the Lord through serving his people. And now I'd like to continue on to verse 10. <clears throat> 
So we've seen that Peter wrote here to these Christians, and he said that as you interact with other believers, you should show love, and you should show hospitality. And now we continue to verse 10. Peter writes, As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter starts out here, as every man has received the gift. And there are different ways of looking at this. Uh, how should I say this? This is more commonly, it's more easily translated as perhaps we have all received a gift of God's grace in manifold forms. I think would be the easiest way to say it. Everybody has received a gift. Let, us, let every man take the gift that God has given him and minister the same one to another. Let's say it that way. So every man should take the gift that God's given him, and he should minister with it to other people. And he says, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So when we think about this grace, he says that, you notice the word manifold there. This isn't a word we use very often in English. But one of the uses of manifold in English is something where maybe you have one pipe that comes in, and then you have five pipes that go out. So it's something that's got many different forms. That's what manifold is. And so when he says that the grace of God is manifold, it's because of that that I know that when he says, as every man has received the gift, as, as it's translated here, he doesn't mean that everybody's received the same gift. He says there are manifold different forms of the grace of God, and we are to be good stewards of them. And so you could equally translate the way that this is worded in Greek. It could be translated as everyone has received a gift, or it could be translated as everyone should take the gift that he has received. So everybody has received at least one gift from God, and everybody should be taking that gift. And it says here, ministering the same gift one to another. And as we said, this isn't that everyone received the same gift. These are manifold different forms. There are many different ways that God has given gifts. I'd like to go turn for a moment to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and let's read verses 5 to 8. And as we read this, I'd like you to think about the same idea that God has given gifts to many different people in different forms. In Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 5, we read, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether of prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. The Apostle Paul writes here that we are many different members. And he says in verse 6 that we have gifts that differ. We don't all have the same gift. We have gifts that are differing according to the grace that is given to us. The exact same idea. God has given out grace to each person, and the, the gifts that God has given to each person are different. And Peter says, I'm sorry, and Paul says here, we are to take those gifts that God has given us, and we are to use them. He says, if you have a gift of prophecy, then prophesy. If you have a gift of ministry, then let's minister. If you have a gift of teaching, then teach. And he continues. And so, as we think about what Peter is saying in 1 Peter 4, it's the same idea here. It's almost worded almost the same way. He uses the same words. He says that God has given grace in many different forms to us, and therefore we should take those gifts and use them for ministry. And here, Peter is talking about our relationship with others. He's saying that each of us has received gifts, and he says, so you should minister the same one to another. The gifts that God has given us, he hasn't just given them to us so that we can minister to ourselves. God, hasn't, if somebody, God has gifted somebody, for example, and let's imagine that this person is able to, uh, is, has some gift with musical instruments, and that they're able to play musical instruments. They're not just to be doing that so that they can make themselves happy. He says we are to be using that to minister to others, one to another. And in fact, that word minister is the Greek word diakonos. It's the same word that we get our word deacon from. It's the idea of somebody who is serving. 
And I believe when I look at this, that the idea here that when Peter says that we are to minister that same gift one to another, I truly believe that Peter does not just mean that within the local church, I should be ministering to the person sitting next to me. I honestly believe that that's not just what he's saying. Because as I mentioned earlier, Peter is writing to these strangers who are scattered about in many different cities. He is writing to believers all over. He's not writing to one church. He's writing to all believers everywhere. And he tells them, you are to take your gift and minister it to others. Just like he said in the previous verse that we are to be lovers of strangers. We are to be hospitable to others. Just as he said that we are to love even those who, we, who have a multitude of sins. When we look at these people, people around us, it's not just the people who are sitting next to us, but it's other believers in general. We should have a desire to take our gifts, our spiritual gifts, the gifts that God has given us, and to minister to them. And so as we think about what Peter is saying here, Peter is writing to these believers to encourage them, not just to look at themselves, not just to be inward focused and say that we are going to use our gifts to build up our own friends and our own families, our own inner circles. But we are to have a desire to go out and minister to others. And this is something that God has been teaching me. And I think that especially as we look at what is going on in our country right now, as we see that we Everybody in our country, for good reasons, but everybody in our country is being encouraged to be careful about their interactions with others. But I think that it's important, even through this difficult time, for us not to forget what God has called us to do. God has not called us as believers to live our own lives as a silo, to use our spiritual gifts to edify ourselves at home. But God has called us to find ways to reach out to others. And this is an important part of the Christian life. And this is why I believe Peter tells, he starts verse 8 by saying, above all things. He's telling the believers that these things are important. And so, this is what I'd like to share with you in testimony this morning. As we think about what God has been doing in the country of Benin in West Africa, I, I'd like to just maybe give you a little bit more of a summary of what he's done there, but I'd like to put it in this context. Um, my wife Kat and I arrived in the country of Benin. Um, as most of you know, we arrived there in 2017 to help people from the local church start a, an evangelistic medical ministry. And so the church in Boifo wanted to start a medical ministry and they needed help in doing that. And they invited us to come to the church, or I'm sorry, to come to the village. And they actually had asked the mission to to help with this. And so there was, there was various help that was provided. There was financial help. Some of that came from this church and from many others. There was also personnel help and there was planning help and logistics and other things that took place. And different believers from different parts of the world worked together. They pooled their financial resources, people from all different parts of the US People from the country of Benin, people from the country of Niger, they worked together to make this ministry a reality. And what happened is that this ministry had a great evangelistic value because the word of God was proclaimed, because people were saved, because people were added to churches, because we saw that the churches there were, were growing. But the ministry also had value to the local believers there. This morning during the Sunday school hour, my wife Kat and I shared a little bit about what was taking place uh, in the lives of some of our clinic staff members. And so for those of you who were here during Sunday school, I showed pictures of many of the different staff members at the clinic who we were serving with in Boifo. And each of these is a Beninese brother or sister in Christ. And all of them, every single one of the staff members was younger than us. It was a young team. Um, and during that three and a half years that we were there, God really blessed us because we were able to see these people growing in their faith. We were able to see that God had taken these people. Um, some of them were very new believers. Some of them had very little Bible education. In fact, some of them were not very good readers either, and so they weren't able to read the Bible very well. And we spent a lot of time over the, with them. And we were, it was a great joy and a blessing to us to work with them because we saw people, in fact, every morning we had a Bible study, and what we would do is uh, each morning, 
Um, so there was a period of time where Pastor Isaac, the pastor of the church, would come and share Bible studies. I shared many of the Bible studies for a period of time. And, but then little by little, I, we started asking others in the group to begin leading the Bible studies. And then eventually we got to the place where we started just going around the group. And every day a different person would, every morning, a different person would pick a scripture passage and would read it to the group, or not, well, actually they wouldn't read it, they would choose the passage, somebody would read it to the group, and then the person who had chosen it would share to the group, this is what this passage means, or this is what God showed me in this passage. And so they weren't teaching, they were more sharing a testimony, they were saying, I read this passage this week, and God spoke to me, and this is what I learned from this passage, or this is what this passage meant. And every clinic staff member started doing that. And at the beginning, they were very uncomfortable with this, it was difficult for them. Uh, at the beginning, um, people would, you know, they would perhaps be nervous of what am I going to say when it's my turn, and then they would, it would be their turn, and they would choose a passage, and then they wouldn't know what to say, uh, or they would be afraid to open their mouths to say something. But over time, this became something that people would love to do, because you'd be able to share with other people, this is what God is doing in my life. This is what God showed me this week. And in fact, some people would even choose a passage they didn't understand. And they would read the passage and they would say, this is what I think this passage means, but I want to understand it more. And this was a blessing to me to see how the staff responded um, as we did that. Because initially, this was a difficult thing, but over time, it became very natural. Every morning, we would meet together as a group. We would open the Bible together. Each, per uh, each person would have a turn. And each day, each day it would be a different person, but we would go around and each person would have a turn to share what they had been studying and what God was showing them through it. And we would then have a discussion as a group. And this was a great blessing to me because I was able to see how God was working in their lives. And over the three and a half years, we saw, I saw people who initially they would read the passage and I would ask them afterward, what does that verse mean? I have no idea. But then with time, they would become used to taking it the time to sit there and read it and study it and think about it. And then they would come and be able to share with the group, this is what God is showing me through this. And then some of them would reach the point where they're able to say, well, and, and in my life this week, I encountered this situation when I was working out on my farm and I thought of this verse. Or this week I encountered this situation and now I know as I read this verse that this is how I should have responded. And to sit there and think about how God is working in these people's lives was really a blessing to me to see what God was doing. And I want to share that with you because I want you to know as a church that every one of you who prayed for us, every one of you who supported, who every one of you who helped in any way in the ministry there, you had a role in this as well. And this ministry has had a great impact on the church in Boifo. And we've seen the church growing. We've seen believers who've been encouraged, who've been active in sharing the gospel with others. And we've seen believers who before were unable to read the Bible and then explain to somebody else who now are happy to open the Bible and share with someone else what they've read or what they've learned. Likewise, um, it's been a blessing to me to see that. So each week, as I mentioned, every Thursday we were going out into people's homes. I mentioned this earlier in Sunday school. And so every Thursday, we would, instead of being at the clinic taking care of patients, we would go out and visit patients at their homes. And we would provide medical care and we would share Bible studies or share our testimonies with them. And when we started doing that, some of the staff members, likewise, it was difficult for them. But over time, people got used to that. And now every one of our staff is comfortable going into someone's home, sitting down with them and sharing, the, sharing their testimony or sharing the gospel. And to watch how God was working, it was a great blessing to me. Uh, and then, and so these things were, and then we had a number of different things taking place. We were doing Bible studies in different people's homes, uh, both patients and as well as people from the clinic staff who would meet in our home for Bible studies. And we were doing a number of things. And then throughout, and then after a period of time, the pandemic hit and the rules changed. And the government said that you can no longer meet in groups and you can never no longer meet without a mask. And the rules for what we could do changed. And so a lot of the ministries that we had been involved in, there was a period of time where we had to drop them. But that's part of why I wanted to share this, these verses with you this morning, is that something that God convicted me is that even if it's difficult, we can never lose sight of the fact that God has called us not just to minister to ourselves, but to minister to others. And when we minister to others, yes, God has called us to share the gospel, and that is a huge part of the calling of the church. But it's not the only part of the calling of the church. One of the ministries, one of the purposes of the church is to edify other believers. And I don't think that God's intention was that each church would function as a silo and edify only themselves. But God has called us as believers to have a desire to reach out to others as well. And when we think about the early church, 
One thing I see in the life of the Apostle Paul is that he encouraged other believers to minister to each other. In fact, when you think about how he handled this, with some churches he would encourage, okay, this church, why don't you take up an offering so that we can take it to these other believers in another church who have needs? And when you see the Apostle Paul in his personal ministry, he didn't just stay at one church. If you think about where he was, God had, so he was saved, and then he spent a good period of time, more than two years, in the church in Antioch. But then eventually, and he was ministering there, and it says that in the church of Antioch, he and Barnabas were teaching. And it says afterwards that as, uh, that these men were ministering to the church, and then the Holy Ghost said, let's separate Paul and Barnabas and send them out to a different ministry. And so they were ministering to that local church. But Paul didn't forget that God wanted him not only to minister to one church, but that God wanted him to be open to ministry to others too. And I think that's one of the things that I've seen in the life of the Apostle Paul is that it was a focus in his life and in his heart that he wanted to reach out to others. And we see that here, what Peter was writing to the church is he's encouraging the same for us. In fact, when you think about, as I think about the Apostle Paul, he would go to a place, he would start a church, he would share the gospel, people would be saved, he would baptize people, he would start a church, he would train leaders, he would leave and go to another place, but then he didn't forget about them. He continued sending them letters, he continued going back and visiting them again. And he would even encourage other churches to minister to them as well. And we see that also in his letters, that at times he would remind people that don't forget this person who's serving the Lord faithfully. Don't forget to minister to them too. And that's something that God has been working in my life. And so I share that with you as a testimony because it's really been on my mind throughout this last few months. And especially this last, as, as we return to the U.S. And I see that things in the U.S. now are quite different from when we left. Um, but I would rem I'd like to remind us that this is something that's very important. Uh, to the Lord, is that we would be ministering to others too. And I'm not saying we should minister to others in a way that violates the government's laws. I'm not saying that we should be ministering to others in a way that's ir irresponsible or perceived as inappropriate. But I think that in the, even in the current climate, there are ways to do it. And so this is something God's been showing me personally. And that's why I wanted to share that with you this morning. Um, I am finishing a little bit early. And I know that normally during the morning service is not the time that you take questions. Normally it would be during the Sunday school hour. So I'm going to ask Pastor, this morning and during Sunday school, I didn't have time to take questions, and now I do. Is it okay if I do that now? <laughs> okay. So this morning, I know that not all of you were here during the Sunday school hour, but during, during this morning during the Sunday school hour, I shared a little bit of an update on, on more on the ministry in Benin, and I didn't have time to take questions. So I'd like to pause now and see if anyone had wanted to ask any questions related to what the Lord's been doing in Benin or related to the future of that ministry.